right, guys, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you a little trick that I'll often use when I'm doing a secondary ignition diagnosis on a car where you've got a bank underneath the intake manifold. Many of you guys have run into this. Now, even if you need to remove the intake manifold because you've rolled out, there's nothing wrong with the secondary ignition in the front accessible part. So now you're thinking, it could be a problem underneath this intake manifold. What are your options? Well, what a lot of people are going to do is they're going to remove the intake manifold. Maybe they'll be smart. They know that when you remove the intake manifold, they'll take the components, the secondary ignition components from under the intake, move them to the front of the vehicle, so swap out. And that way, if there's a problem with the secondary, it's going to be in the front of the vehicle. You put everything back together. You've also got the expense of intake manifold gaskets. Maybe you've also got some water pipe gaskets, throttle body gaskets, depending on the model. So there's some expense with this. If you're doing this yourself, great, whatever. But if you're doing this as a professional, which I am not a professional, of course, but if you are, well, now you've got a problem because you've got to charge for that diagnostic time. So you've got a two hour time just setting up now that's gonna work out really great if your problem happens to be in front of the engine and now you replace a coil or a spark plug or a wire or whatever. But what if you still have the misfire? Well, now you've got a really big problem. You don't even know if uh, maybe it was a fuel problem now. Do you wanna take the intake off again and swap fuel injectors? Uh, maybe you should have checked compression while you were there. Maybe it's still an ignition problem, but it's a problem with the wiring. There's no signal to that coil. There's an open ground, there's something. So now you take that apart again, what, what do you, how are you gonna charge for this? What's your plan here? So you can see that this can become very problematic. Now, of course, for a lot of people, they're just going to disregard uh, learning new techniques and everything, and they're gonna say, well, if that happens, I'm gonna send it off to someone else. And that's fine. Here's three problems with that strategy. First of all, you're gonna start sending a lot of cars off to other people if you don't start learning some new, better techniques because newer cars and even not so newer cars already have a bunch of cylinders underneath the intake manifold or they'll have other electronics that you've got to adapt to. So if you're just gonna send those ones off to someone else and you're gonna stick with your carburetors, you're not gonna have a lot of cars to work on. If you're doing this for a living, you're gonna start limiting your market. The second problem with the strategy of just let the other guys do that fancy stuff is that at some point, not only are you gonna have the issue where you've gotta send a lot of people off, but you're also gonna have a lot less people coming in. What have I been doing this? Uh, nine years, I guess now. How many engines with a carburetor have I seen in the nine years I've been doing this? I probably can count them on one hand. How many with a distributor on them? Like like probably six, seven. So again, you're gonna find yourself in a really, really, really limited market. Again, if you're doing this for a living, you're gonna find yourself having a harder and harder time even getting customers to turn away to people who can do this. Third one is a special problem for people on this channel. And that is when people send those cars off to people who can do this stuff, that's you. You're the person that they would send it to. So if you don't adapt in how to be able to do some of these things, you're gonna be no better than the people sending it to you and you're gonna say, oh yeah, I would also have to charge you $600 just to diagnose it. Um, that's unacceptable, you can't do that. You're the person that they go to that can do it right, right? So um, there's no way around it. You've got to learn to do this stuff if you're going to continue on with this one way or another. So let's take a look at what we've got here. I've got a, a basic setup. This won't be a car with the cylinder bank underneath an intake manifold, but we're just going to use this simpler car to set up a situation to show as an example how you would do this. All right, well, this is as easy as it gets. Got a uh, 04 Acura TSX with four cylinder engine. You can see you got your coil on plugs right here. Easy to access. Dream if you're gonna be doing any kind of secondary ignition diagnosis. 
If we had any kind of misfire, of course, what most people are going to do, and what I would do, as a matter of fact, is we would just swap coil positions and swap plug positions, look at where the misfire moves to, and then wherever that misfire moved to, that component would be our fault. The issue is, what if this design had it where this bank was underneath the intake manifold? Well, here is the way that I would address finding a misfire on this vehicle to see if I need to remove the intake manifold. Now, if I determine I need to remove the intake manifold, now I can charge the customer telling them their problem is with ignition under the intake manifold, I have to charge extra on this diagnosis. So let's look at how we're gonna do this. All right, if we look right here, we have a shared ground for all of the ignition coils. Now be aware on some V engines, you'll have one ground for the coils on one bank of the engine and another ground for coils on the opposite bank of the engine. So they may not always all go through one ground, but on the same bank, they will. The first step is I'm going to identify this type of ignition system. We've got three wire ignition system. This tells me there must be a transistor located inside the coil. We know from previous videos how this is gonna work and there is going to be shared ground for all of these coils. We're gonna have power, we're gonna have signal input, we're gonna have a shared ground that's gonna go to a block or frame or something. This will not be a ground side switched circuit like what you would have in a two wire coil. So on this system, we're gonna be able to do this. All I'm gonna do is take an amp clamp set to the 20 amp scale. We're gonna loop that ground just like that. All right, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up our oscilloscope here. Oh man, this guy's got an oscilloscope. Well, no wonder he can do this. He spent thousands of dollars. Well, you can get an oscilloscope that would do this for as little as actually a hundred dollars. So there's no excuse for that. And also, uh, just because you have the oscilloscope doesn't mean that it tells you what's wrong. You don't go to a doctor and he runs blood tests and it tells him in the blood test, this guy has leukemia. You have to interpret the results. This is a skill. We wanna to go to PicoScope here and we're just gonna use this as a starting point. Let's get this engine going and let's see what happens. Okay, worked out pretty good here. We can see our ignition firing events perfectly fine. We can, if we want, we can increase scale a little bit just for a little better resolution. And that's a bit unnecessary. Right there, I think will be pretty good. Uh, what we wanna do is expand this out so that we have four firing events uh, for this particular engine. If you've got an eight cylinder engine, you're gonna wanna set the scale so you have eight firing events within the screen. Uh, we have a four cylinder, so we only need four firing events within the screen. There's only three, so this is gonna be our optimal setting. We got a couple of extras in there, that's okay. All right, not necessary to set a trigger here, but I will, let's just do that, just so that it looks a little bit more friendly. All right, so now we've got our firing events here. Okay, now let's induce some misfire here. Now, of course, you don't know which cylinder's misfiring. There's misfire, there's misfire, there's misfire. See right there, there's misfire. Misfire, now it's back. Misfire. All right, so just with that, in a few seconds, we have determined with 100% certainty, we have a definite ignition misfire in this engine. This is an ignition problem. But the question is, is this problem in the cylinder underneath the intake manifold that we got to dig into? Or is it easy and it's going to be in the cylinder bank where it's easily accessible, not under the intake manifold? Obviously, in order to know that, we need to know which cylinder it is, and we have no way looking at that which cylinder we have no idea which cylinder is which we just know one has the misfire in it so let's go back and let's identify which cylinder is misfiring all right so once again as we see you do not know which cylinder is associated with each amperage ramp here 
Now, of course, a lot of you guys are saying, well, this is ridiculous. A scan tool can tell you which cylinder is misfiring. Well, as anybody with any experience knows, that's not always the case. Very often, you'll have a PO300 code where you'll have different misfires on different cylinders, and you're not quite sure if it's because of single cylinder uh, or if there's actual legitimate misfires in the PO300. The other issue is even if the misfire counter does show you that you've got a misfire on cylinder number five exclusively, which is underneath the intake manifold, is that an ignition problem? You do not know. The scan tool will not tell you that it is because of secondary ignition, if it's because of a primary ignition, if it's a lack of a signal to that particular coil, maybe the PCM got fried from a short, maybe it's a fuel injector problem, maybe it's a compression problem. You do not know still that you have to take off the intake manifold necessarily to get to that issue, right? So again, thinking, thinking here. We need to know where that misfire was. So what we're going to do now is we are going to create a reference mark for a known cylinder and then we can calculate which cylinder was misfiring by looking at the firing order. For this, I'm going to use this probe that, of course, brings up another elephant in the room. Well, why don't you just use the probe to look at the cylinder underneath the intake? And usually I'll do that. That's actually normally what I will do is I will use this and I will feed it under the intake manifold or between the runners. But there are many, many, many cars where you can't even fit this probe between the runners or under the intake to get to the coil, many cars. So you still can't rely on a little probe like this either. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hook up this probe to a second channel. All right, let's turn on channel B. And it doesn't matter what we, you know, we're not looking at quantitation here. We can do voltage, we can do whatever. Let's set this pretty low here so that we get a good high spike. As you can see, we've got a lot of background there, and there is a lot of feedback. Let me see if I can choose a better ground position. Yeah, there's a little better ground position. And what we're going to do is we're going to go, now this would be, of course, of course, on an ignition coil on the front of the engine. So we're going to go to a known coil that we can access. Now, remember, some coils have a uh, shielding on them that you also won't be able to use your probe here on the shielded coils. And in that case, what I would do is I would back probe the coil to look for an input signal is what I would do. And we may actually have to do it on this car because I'm not able to, oh, there it is right there. Okay, so this is number four right here. Let's overlay these just a little bit so it's easy to identify. Move my trigger point here. Let's get our misfire going. There's our misfire. And now we need to get our cylinder identification. There it is right there. There it is again. Right there. We caught our cylinder identification there. Let's turn off this car and analyze. So right now, we did not have the misfire. We see that we've got our consistent firings on every coil, but we know that guy right there, obviously, that's my voltage from the capacitive pickup. So we know that that is number four. Now we need to know the firing order of this engine. The firing order I looked up is one, three, four, two. All right, if the firing order is one, three, four, two, and this is four, one, three, four, two. So we know our cylinder numbers here. Now, of course, it doesn't do us any good. We don't have the misfire. Let's go to a frame now that has the misfire. Okay, there's one right there. Perfect. All right, we know now cylinder number one is the one with the issue. How do we know? We're missing an event here. This is number four. So it would be one, three, four, two. Repeating again, one, we have two events in a row where number one has misfired. We know cylinder number one is without question our problem. If cylinder number one happens to be underneath the intake manifold, we are going to have to go under there in order to fix it 
we now know that we can justify a charge in the customer diagnostic fee because it includes removal of an intake manifold. All right, there you have it. If I wasn't filming, and I do this all the time, from booting the computer up to making my probe connections to analyzing the data, looking up the cylinder numbering, looking up the firing order, all together usually takes me less than half an hour, between 20 and 30 minutes, a fraction of the time that it would take to remove an intake manifold, particularly if I find out, A, I didn't need to remove the intake manifold, or B, I have to remove the intake manifold again because I missed the first time what's under there. Uh, the beautiful thing about this is, I guess, if a customer came to me and said, well, they were going to charge me $300 just to look at it because they have to remove the intake. What if I said, well, how about this? How about if I diagnose it for half that price? Customer thinks I'm a magician. They would be amazed. They think I'm the most charitable person in the world. But actually, I got paid $300 an hour is what would have happened there. And I'm giving the customer a break. I get paid for 20 minutes of work on two hours. <laughs> um, the, the ability to do this can dramatically, dramatically increase your income as well as your efficiency. So uh, my suggestion, keep watching all those videos that you saw me doing the electrical and the scope that you skipped over because you'll never do that stuff. I don't know. Maybe you should rethink that. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.